Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, well, as Brian said, my name is Tom Wilkie. Um, I work for Weaveworks as a software engineer. Um, we have a bunch of stuff, a bunch of items in the fire, but today I'm really talking about this project Frankenstein. Um, Julius' name is up here because Julius has actually been working with me on it for about two months. Um, so, you know, this is really what's made it possible. First off, uh, I'd like to start with questions. So everyone put their hands up. Everyone put your hands up. Okay. Right, now put your hands down if you're not using containers. And, okay, how about using, you know, I mean Docker containers now. Put your hands down. And in production, if you're not using them in production, put your hands down. Oh, that's a lot of, lot of containers in production. That's good. Okay. So now keep your hands up. Good. Now, if you're using Kubernetes. Put your hands down if you're not, rather, sorry. Not making it to sound like it. Okay, how about in production? Put your hands down if you're not using Kubernetes in production. So some of us actually use Kubernetes. I should keep my hand up. Okay, right, now keep your hands up. Who's heard of Weave? Other than, obviously, plus all over this event. Okay, and who's actually used it? Okay, great, well, that's, that's audience participation over. We can go back to sleep now. Um, the other question I get about this project is where does the name come from? Um, so one evening I, I went home to my girlfriend and said oh, I'm working on this new exciting project. Uh, it's called Prometheus and they're going to be doing some really cool stuff. Yeah, I need a name. And she's a bit of a literary buff and she came up with Frankenstein because apparently the subtitle is A Modern Prometheus. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's awfully like, you know, setting expectations really high. <laughs> so I can fail. But yeah. So that's why the name, um, and that one, one sentence about the company, this is kind of our thing about being the best way to visualize, manage, monitor your cloud native applications. So um, that kind of is a way we try and unify everything we do because we do so many different things. Anyway, so we started off, the journey started off with this, this thing called Weave Scope. Um, this is a uh, visualization tool for cloud native applications for Microsoft, Docker, blah, blah, blah. And as you can see, we started gathering some metrics in Scope. Um, it's really, really basic, don't really do anything special, and you know, I thought, you know, we'll leave this to the experts at some point. Then next we built a hosted version of Scope called Weave Cloud. Um, it's pretty cool, go try it out if you like. And, you know, finally we got this launched at DockerCon two months ago, and finally it's now time to focus on the metrics bit that we said we'd do a long, long time ago. And as part of running the uh, version of Weave Cloud, why we use, uh, why we use Kubernetes in production, we use Prometheus to monitor the, our running service. And we absolutely love it. Um, and we thought, you know, what we want to do is we want to make a version of this that our customers can use. So, that's really the short story that leads up to, you know, why not just run your own Prometheus? Why, why should we bother building a service? Well, we, I quite like running software as a service as a developer because you get instant feedback, you can, you can understand what's happening with the service, but, but really I should look at this from a customer's point of view. And Well, Julius kind of touched on this in the beginning, Prometheus doesn't do any access control. The Weave Cloud stuff that we've got does access control, so our hosted version of Prometheus has authentication and you can share it and so on. Also, you know, there's been some talk about retention periods. I'm going to explain how we've achieved this later, but with the hosted version of, of Prometheus, we can have virtually infinite retention. You know, that's a big, bold promise, and hopefully you'll believe me by the end of the talk. Uh, I also wanted to provide a different story around durability in HA. I think Prometheus has an incredibly strong story about, about HA, but uh, I want a different one. You know, I, I don't like the idea of a failure having a gap in my graph, so I, I, want, you know, I want reliability through scale out, as Brian alluded to. And eventually, we haven't done this yet, but eventually we want to offer you know, better query performance by parallelizing queries across workers. And this is especially going to be useful for very long-term queries, which kind of links in nicely to the, to the point about infinite retention. You know, I want you to be able to go and say, please tell me the CPU, CPU usage of my cluster forever, you know, for the last however long you've been running it, and, and have that return in a reasonable amount of time. So, you know, the virtually infinite retention is something we can do because it's actually provided for us by AWS, um, which we'll come on to later. So the API compatibility, so the requirements, you know, what, what's important? What did we set out when we started designing this? It was going to be 100% API compatible with Prometheus. And in fact, we really wanted to go a lot further than that. We wanted to reuse as much of the Prometheus code as we, as we could. Um, something, something we maybe semi-achieved. Um, we wanted this, we're a small company. We're about 20, 20 people in WeaveWorks, split across three sites. And uh, that means, you know, we don't have a 15-person SRE team who are going to run this. Uh, service for us, so it has to be super easy to operate and manage. 
Um, it has to be complete low cognitive load. You know, it has to be really, really easy. Also, you know, we're really optimistic. We think we're going to get tens of thousands of users when we launch it, um, which kind of means, you know, I'm sure people will argue about this. I'm sure there's lots, lot larger users in, in this room, but we're kind of aiming for tens of millions of samples a second for this service. You know, hopefully more, but, but that's kind of the initial aim. The other thing, in the market for monitoring, I don't know how much you know about it, but like, you know, there's a lot of players, it's a very crowded market, and it's a race to the bottom. So the kind of margins and overhead in this market, really, really low. And so this has to be cheap for us to run. It has to be really cost effective for us to run. And this really actually is probably the key motivator in the design that we eventually went with. Yeah, and I've, I've covered reusing as much as Prometheus as possible. So, so two, and, two and three kind of implied to us this needs to be horizontally scalable. Um, there are alternatives to doing it. You can, you can shard based on user. You could do other things. But we really wanted this to be nice and horizontally scalable and also scalable without intervention. You know, we didn't want to be man uh, manually configuring you know, which user went to which replica and stuff like that. We also wanted to make it completely stateless because it's much, much easier to run a stateless service than it is to run a stateful service. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, how the hell do you run a, a stateless time series database? Well, I'll show you how. Um, we used third-party services. It was really what we did to solve that problem. So we reused as much of Amazon is where we run, like probably most people. So we reused as many of their services as we could in, a, in, as, as, in as cost-effective way as we could. So it actually meant we had to be really careful about how much of the Amazon services we consumed. It would be really easy to, to, to run up a huge bill if we weren't careful. And I just wanted to add out there, because I'm seeing a lot of kind of people who are a bit worried or daunted by this prospect. This is all open source. This is, you know, go to my GitHub, there's a link at the end of it. We, WeaveWorks are very committed to open source projects, and everything we do is open source. And Weave Cloud, you can go and download the source code and the binaries that we run on Weave Cloud and run it yourself. And there's a few bits missing, like the user management bit is something we're, we've not open sourced because there are better alternatives. But realistically, everything we do is open source, so don't fear. So here's the time scale we went with. We started this project just over two months ago. We uh, started by circulating this design doc, which hopefully some of you might have seen. We sent it to the, to the Prometheus developers mailing list. Um, we discussed it with most of the core developers and, and a whole bunch of other people. And really, we started hacking on this you know, in earnest about two months ago. Um, we launched our first jobs into our development cluster a month ago. And I'm giving this talk now, allegedly. So how, what does this look like? How does this work? So we, we've tried to take the principle of, of decomposing Prometheus into a set of microservices. And actually, like in hindsight, you can debate whether that was a good idea or not. I don't think it was actually that important. Um, what we've done, we've broken it down into three bits, a retriever, a distributor, and an ingester. And I'll describe what they all do, but it's actually just easier if we trace through the life of a sample and how the sample uh, propagates through the system. So firstly, you've got some jobs running in your data center, and you also have to run a retriever in your data center. And the retriever is just a vanilla Prometheus. There's, there's very little modifications we've added to it. Um, the retriever scrapes like normal Prometheus does, gathers up all the samples, and then sends them over to our service. And there's some front-end authentication that goes on, but that's not particularly interesting. So then it will randomly hit a distributor. So the, we just use Kubernetes load balancing here. You can use whatever flavor load balancing you like, but we hit a random distributor. And the distributor now starts to understand the architecture of the system. It understands which ingester should, should own which sample effectively. So the distributor will then distribute the samples amongst the ingesters. Some ingesters might get more samples, some ingesters might get less, we'll cover that in a minute. And then eventually this will happen over and over again, and these ingesters are buffering it in memory, and eventually they've got enough samples to write out a chunk to S3, and then they'll also write an index into DynamoDB. So the, the key thing to note here is actually the chunk format is Bjorn's chunk format. This is just the Prometheus chunk format. The ingesters do keep the samples in memory, so there's a durability issue that we should, you know, we need to fix before we... Uh, before we you know, start charging people for this. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. The other thing that's quite interesting here, you, know, you hear a lot in the Prometheus community about push versus pull. We have both. <laughs> so there you go. Um, <laughs> so Retriever, I'll just quickly go over these uh, components that we've got. This is a vanilla Prometheus. We use Brian's uh, PR for generic rights, which basically means that you can get your data out of the, the uh, Retrievers or Prometheus and send them to a, to a HTTP endpoint. It's super simple. 
Um, this is still in PR, but we're hoping, you know, we're hoping to kind of, you know, help that go upstream, hopefully. We've also added a small modification to prevent your local retriever from doing any indexing or doing any uh, storage. But this is optional, you know, if you wanted to use that as a primary system and use our system as a backup system, that's, of course, something you can do. And then, yeah, you run bin Prometheus, retrieval only, storage, remote, generic URL, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, this obviously uses the same configuration for scraping, the same service discovery. This does, you know, a lot of the work for us, which is fantastic. So, one of the things that's, uh, that's kind of interesting here, I thought, is we, because the model for our scale out is um, lots and lots of users, and those users are probably going to be, you know, not huge, they're not going to be the biggest users, they're probably going to be of some average size, we didn't actually consider how to scale out the retrievers. So uh, the Vulcan project, which was open sourced a couple of days ago, at least I saw the source code a couple of days ago, has, has actually done a lot more work there in, in how to horizontally scale the retrieval step. So distributor. This uses a consistent hashing algorithm to assign ranges around a hash ring to ingesters. Um, the input to the hash we use is the user ID and the metric name. And this is actually probably the key design trade-off that we had to make. And, and we'll discuss that a bit more in a minute. The tokens for the hash, so the, the hash is a 32-bit unsigned integer, um, so 0 all the way through to 2 to 32, and the tokens are stored in console. Um, this is just for, you know, ease of use. Um, at Weave, we've, we've got this library called Weave Mesh, which is a gossip, uh, it's kind of eventual consistency library that's actually used by Alert Manager. Uh, sorry to steal your thunder, uh, Fabian. But yeah, so um, we're, we're considering, I was just talking to Jono about maybe moving this over to use Weave Mesh. Um, should make it easier to use. Uh, the distributor, it's also worth noting, the distributor is where the PromQL queries are parsed using Prometheus's PromQL parsers and, you know, where the queries are executed. Uh, so let's talk about the input hash because this is kind of the key. By, by not only signing, uh, uh, sharding on user ID and metric name, uh, sorry, by not only sharding on user ID, but by including metric name, we get significantly better load balancing. But it's still not perfect, right? Because this is assuming lots of users are of different sizes. If you just sharded on username, on user ID, you would get quite uneven sharding. And so by adding more and more information into the hash, you'd get better and better sharding. Ideally, you'd want to add all of your, your entire label set for every time series, for every sample, into the hash. But then it becomes quite difficult to route the queries. So when you root a query, you need to know which ingester to send the query for the last hour's worth of data for. Um, so this compromise allows you to do pretty much most queries that Prometheus can do, but also gives you pretty good load balancing. And it's not perfect. You know, it is a compromise. For instance, one of the things you can't do with the system is you can't do queries that don't specify a metric name. And when I started doing this, I didn't know of any useful queries that didn't specify a metric name, and I've learned a lot. So now you hear. So one more thing, just one more shout out. If you follow this link, there's a, a presentation about Cassandra's virtual node scheme, which actually uh, myself and a couple of my colleagues developed, what year is it? Four years ago at a different company. And it's exactly the same scheme we've used in Prometheus. And it's, it's quite powerful. I'm not going to explain it here. There's a whole half an hour talk just about how you do the consistent hashing. Oh, and it's worth mentioning we intend to do replication as well, so we can survive ingester failure, um, but we don't do that yet. And the, ingest, uh, the replication will probably follow a kind of Dynamo style. If you've, you all should have read the paper by now, at least. So the ingester, the next, next uh, section, this is actually a uh, copy of the memory series storage from, from Prometheus that, that I've kind of simplified a little bit. Um, it uses the same chunk format. It uses a lot of the same data structures as Prometheus's internals. It's packaged in a separate binary, but, but it, it needn't be. Um, it keeps everything in memory for a configurable amount of time, and currently that's set. No, actually, currently it's set to like 10 minutes, isn't it? I forget. It currently, you know, it's intention it'll be about an hour. It also stores, and this is crucial, it also stores an inverted in-memory index to enable it to do the queries. Um, it's key to note this is all in memory. So if an ingester dies, or if the whole service dies, you'll lose your hour's worth of data. So the intention here is to keep a commit log, again, in a kind of Cassandra-style commit log of all the chunks coming, of all these samples coming in, so that if an ingester does die, when it comes back, it can replay its commit log, rebuild it, its indexes, rebuild its chunks, and then continue where it left off. But it's also key to note, this only has an hour's worth of data in it. So there's really very little kind of, uh, they're very non-performance sensitive, so it's like a really, really slimmed down Prometheus server here. So next final bit, um, DynamoDB and S3, 
Uh, we chose these as, as I said, we're a small company. We don't have a lot of uh, people working for us. And, and we really, you know, having run quite a few Cassandra databases, I did not want to run another one. So, um, so DynamoDB is expensive, but it's actually a really good service, low latency. It's fantastic. So we just, we just bought that. Um, it's quite easy to swap it out. Um, we, haven't, we haven't built the interfaces yet, but we really want to have kind of the back ends, you know, where this stuff gets stored, be swappable and pluggable. And Cassandra would be, you know, if you're not running an AWS, or say you're running in GCE and you want to use Bigtable, or say you're running on your own hardware and you want to use HBase or Cassandra, that's something we really want to, you know, achieve. Um, this is, how long have I got? I'm running out of time. The key format we've used is actually really crucial to how we enable queries here. So we're maintaining an external inverted index, an external memory inverted index here. So it's quite, uh, it's quite important how you model the data, right? So if you don't know, an inverted index would be the same technology that Google search uses, right, to, uh, to match queries. Um, now what we do, our inverted index is, it's quite hard to explain. DynamoDB has two concepts, it's a hash key, and you can basically just do fetches on a hash key, and then it has a range key, and a range, query allow, a range key allows you to do range queries. Now, the combination of the two allows you to get good, load, uh, good even balancing in your DynamoDB cluster and enables range queries, which are super important, not only for time series databases, but also for doing, uh, for doing label matches that aren't quality. So say I want to do a regex label, label matcher, I have to do a range query over all the values of that label to find the chunks that, that use that, uh, that, that match. So again, I could probably spend 20 minutes talking just about the DynamoDB schema, and it's something... Julius and I spent a long time working on and a long time going over and over, and, and there's you know, a lot of tweaks and a lot of a subtlety there. Um, but again, this is, is kind of interesting. And the chunks, finally, the chunks are stored in S3. And in the future, what we'd really like to do is build jobs that, that time, take the small one kilobyte chunks and build them up into larger and larger chunks to make the kind of efficient uh, historical queries that, that I've been talking about you know, really possible. So, evaluation, you know. We set out two months ago, we thought it was pretty ambitious. What, what did we do? Well, it works. I should have really said, it's alive, but, <laughs> but I didn't. And we got it done in two months, and this is fantastic. Um, it actually, we've been, I don't know about you, Julius, but I've been pretty impressed with its performance and its reliability. I mean, it is a prototype. This is you know, a message I want to get out there. Like, it is a prototype, but it actually works, and it, it seems to be pretty reliable. It, it does all the queries you'd expect it to do. And this chap in the corner is because I'm going to do the good, the bad. Um, hashing scheme means we can't do queries that don't involve metric names. I touched on that earlier. This is probably a limitation that I can't live without. It's probably something we're going to have to fix. And Julius and I have started talking about how we're going to fix that. Um, then it's also because of the hashing scheme, and actually the real crux of this whole design is this compromise we've made in the hashing scheme, uh, it's also possible to hotspot an ingester, especially if you want to be like an adversarial user. And as we're going to be running this as a service, we should expect a few of those. Um, so again, this points to the fact that we're going to have to come and revisit this, uh, this, this scheme we've come up with. And finally, yeah, the code. No offense, Julius. I think you'd, you'd be the first to say, we, we did a bit of a rush job. It's fine. It works. And it's getting better. And we, our plan is to incrementally improve this over the, follow, over the next few months to, to have the kind of code quality that we really uh, you know, desire. Yeah. So next, demo. Let's see if we can get this to work. So. Do, do, do. So first things first. It's over here. Thank you. So first things first, I'm going to go to our dev cluster. And hopefully it logs me in. Yep. I'm looking at this screen up here. So oh, that's better. So this is, oh, well, this will work. This is uh, Scope, which I touched on at the very beginning. And I'm just going to use this to show you what the service looks like. Um, so that's not, that's not the service. Uh, let's go to this one up here. And then let's go to this one down here. So this is a Kubernetes cluster, blah, 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 Frankenstein namespace. This is what it looks like. And what you can see here, we're only running a single distributor right now. It, actually, I don't know why we're not running more. It would be super easy, but it's not a bottleneck. We're running four ingesters, one, two, three, four, five ingesters. Uh, there's a retriever over here that's also running in our cluster because we like to dog food our own product. And the retriever is scraping all the components, which is why you see this myriad of lines. And then we've got console uh, sitting kind of around the place and some memcache clusters, uh, some memcache nodes as well. It's actually much easier if you, um, my cursor's on the screen, much easier if you kind of aggregate together all the pods in the same service and you get a much clearer picture of what the architecture of the system looks like. And now the next thing is I can go to the multi-tenant Prometheus interface. 
So, oh, there you go. And this should all be the Prometheus user interface that you know and love. And so I've got the same screen up here, so I'm going to minimize it because it's really confusing me. Okay, now, if we do, let's, uh, I talked about this hash scheme. And, and if you go and read the, the slide deck I linked to, you'll see how the hash scheme guarantees a pretty even load balancing. But I've also talked about how there's some problems with that. So let's see what the load balancing is. Let's get percent. And you get tab completion like you do in normal Prometheus. Percent ownership. And then press enter. And there we go. So you can see that some of there's five nodes, so you would expect each one to have 20%. I'm sorry, you can't read this. Let me, uh, there you go. You'd expect, uh, you'd expect everyone to have 20, and some of them have 19, and some of them have 21. One's got 18, so it's not perfect. It needs a bit more work. But this is interesting. Well, I'm in the dev uh, environment here. Let's switch to a different environment and really demonstrate that this is multi-tenancy. Right, so if I switch to the prod environment, and I'm not going to Prometheus, and then I type percent. They look the same. Was I? Thank you, Johnny. Let's switch to the dev environment. <laughs> and type percent. Percent. And they look different now. And look, there's only four of them. So this just, you know, quickly, obviously proves to everyone unequivocally that this is really a multi-tenanted system. Um, you can do other queries. Obviously, this is just a normal Prometheus. Does anyone have a favorite query? No? Good. Then I'll move on. So, um, what's next? You know, what are we going to do next? Well, I, we very much intend to continue working on this. We currently don't support recording rules, and we don't do alerting. So that's very much the next thing I'm going to do. And that's, I think once we've got recording rules and alerting, then we're going to start using this as our main monitoring system and really dogfooding it. Then reliability, you know, there's a long list of things we need to do. We need to implement replication. We need to get the ingester lifecycle code working properly. Consider separating out the query service so we can scale it up independently. I don't know, that's something we keep going around on. Or maybe just condense it all down into a single service to make it easier to, easier to use. Query parallelization, I touched on background chunk coalescing, I touched on code cleanup. The other thing I'm, I'm super keen on, this is currently uh, my, lo my um, personal fork of Prometheus and I've just worked on there in, in that repo, but hopefully some of the changes we make, we can work with the upstream team to, uh, with, the, with the upstream maintainers to upstream and, and then really figure out exactly kind of, you know, whether the whole thing should go upstream or whether different bits of it or, or exactly what we do. I mean, it's, it's out of my hands, but, but yeah. So, that's kind of it. The slides don't work. There we go. Questions? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, were keeping some of the the time series in memory in the ingester for an hour. That's right. Um, when you actually do queries, do the queries have to go to a combination of S3 and the ingester? Or yes. Can, okay. So that's why the query code lives in the distributor, because the, distribu uh, the distributor has the knowledge of uh, which ingester is storing that hour in memory for that particular time series. Um, so yeah, it goes and hits that, it goes and hits S3, and... and um, uh, Bjorn was alluding to these iterators. So all we've done is built a couple more iterators, a merging iterator and some iterators for the chunk store um, that, that basically merged this all up. And that was actually Julius that did that. So blame him. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, yeah. Oh, go on then. So is this going to stay open source? Even if you then, I mean, if you're finished at some point and have a product and sell it, will it still be open source at that point? In every, I mean, it's not my company, but everything we do is open source and everything we've done has always been open source. So I think, you know, something would really have to go bad. Plus, we've done it under the same license that Prometheus is under. So, you know, there's no way to unopen source it, really, is there? No, we're, we're yeah, everything we do is open source. It's going to stay open source. I'm, I'm pretty committed to that. We get lots of questions, uh, you know, on IRC and whatnot. It's like, can someone please run it for me? So I don't think open sourcing it is necessarily a, a business problem. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole company's business model is, you know, build open source software and run it for you, you know. I'm super curious about uh, the performance of using S3 as your backend, because I would have thought that you would have used like an EBS or something like that. Can you talk about 
what kind of performance you're seeing loading it off of S3? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. We, um, we were suspect as well. Um, for the multi-tenant scope that I briefly showed you, we've done exactly the same thing. So an index in DynamoDB and uh, we store reports in S3. The performance is okay, but it depends how much you use it. I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, some, maybe somebody else knows more about S3 than I do, but I'm assuming behind the scenes in S3, they're scaling in response to demand, in response to load. So if you don't use it very much, your first query might be a few seconds, but then suddenly our ones after that will be sub-second queries, you know, it'll be a few hundred milliseconds. We, you, I briefly alluded to it as well, we've got loads and loads of memcache in front of S3, so the reality is you shouldn't really be hitting S3. I think we do write ahead to, to S3 as well in the yeah. chunks? Yeah, so... To memcache, sorry. Yeah, so we write ahead cache as well. So every time we flush a chunk to S3, we also put it into the memcache, and then we leave memcache to do its LRU thing. So yeah, the reality is I don't have a graph of it, but your query shouldn't hit S3. You know, S3 is really for those long-term queries where we can massively parallelize them over a set of workers, and we expect it to take seconds. So you have metrics for this? Sorry? So you don't have metrics? We do have metrics. No, of course we do. Um, but Julius built them, so I don't know what they do. <laughs> uh, the instrument. Here we go. This is the... The dashboard is not ideal at the moment. <laughs> do you mind if I show it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we've got... So I renamed the retriever job um, because I brought this up in production this morning, which, you know, why not? Um, so that's why that graphs are broken. But um, the, the rest of the graphs show stuff. You know, we had some problems with DynamoDB earlier because um, I saw everyone's... I saw everyone giving their presentations about the massive thousands, millions of QPS they were doing, and we were doing like five. So I thought, well, I'll just turn all my retrieval periods down from like 15 seconds to one second and, and just 15x the load on the system. So that's what that spike was. Uh, I then fixed the problem that it, in, <laughs> it caused, and, and it's fine. And then, yeah, so we do, have, we do have quite a lot of metrics, and this is actually, this is one of the favorite ones. If anyone here uses DynamoDB, it has this, it's thickly provisioned, unlike all the other Amazon uh, products. So you have to tell them, I want 800 QPS from my DynamoDB. And if you go over that, they throttle you. And so one of the things when using DynamoDB, you really, really have to monitor is how much of this capacity, this thickly provisioned capacity you're using. So that's, that's that graph there. Um, but yeah, we've got loads of monitoring for it. Um, the problem, right, is knowing which bit's useful. Yeah. Any more questions? So one of the things I should have said whilst you think of your insightful questions, is um, this is now like running, and we're looking for people to try it out and tell us if they like it. You know, we, we as I just discussed, uh, can only generate a limited amount of load ourselves. Um, we want real world users to tell us whether this is useful, whether this is, so come along and try it out. And uh, yeah, email help at weave.works apparently, and I'll send you some instructions and add you to this little white list so that you can have access to it. Um, I was curious how you are doing testing. So one of the problems we had was generating good test sets. We do all kind of crazy like sine waves and stuff like this. Yeah. I don't know if you've come up with a good solution for that. No, um, no, we haven't. We, uh, we take the view of dog fooding, basically. So that's, that's really our test environment. We have a, a development environment, you know, a separate Kubernetes cluster that we continue. Every change set gets deployed there basically instantly and it monitors itself, it's also monitoring production. And so, yeah, dog food and unit tests, and that's about it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, uh, <laughs> and after Tom, we next up have Tom with a word for sponsors. So, I've been forced to give a sponsor pitch. Not forced, politely asked. I don't normally do this, so I'm gonna make it really quick. Uh, we don't just do Prometheus as a service. We have this thing called WeaveNet. It's an SDN for your containers. You should use it. It's quite cool, actually. I wrote Weave DNS, and it's this gossip-based DNS library, uh, DNS service. That's pretty cool. Um, also, the thing behind WeaveNet is this Weave Mesh, this gossip-based library that Peter in the back, is Peter in the back? Yeah. Peter works on. And uh, that is the thing that Fabian hopefully will mention in one of the lightning talks. This works with Mesos, Kubernetes, and Docker. The other thing you have seen is WeaveScope. Uh, I, that was, and again, another thing we've worked on for quite a while, and it's pretty cool. It visualizes stuff for you. Uh, we've got a new office in Berlin, and, and four people there now, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. And yeah, it's awesome. It's, I've never seen it, but apparently it looks really nice. I'm going to go and see it on Monday. 
And we have three offices, two other offices, three offices elsewhere, San Francisco and London, and we're massively hiring. We just got a big load of investment from Google Ventures. So come and work for us. And that's the end of the pitch. Thank you.